Hello and welcome to What the Bible Says podcast, where we seek to find answers to the questions that you ask. The goal for every podcast is to answer questions only using the Bible, as we believe the Bible is still relevant to answer questions today. Although some of the volunteers in this group attend local churches, we are not supported by any church or denomination in any way, shape, or form. We receive no funding from any congregation or organizations. Let's search together what the Bible says. We continue our study of Is My Church the One That Is in the Bible? This is number eight of nine studies that we're going to have concerning that very question. We've talked about the one church. We have talked about various aspects of worship. And now we want to focus on some things with reference to the work that the church may do. So we're continuing to ask this question, is my church the one that is in the Bible? And here we want to raise the question about benevolence. And that is, what can the church do with reference to benevolence? What responsibility does the church have? Can the church help just anyone? Or is the church limited as to who it may help out of its treasury? Who can the church help? Now let's talk about some common ideas about benevolence. There are many people in the religious world that think of the church as a source for helping just about anyone who asks for help. Anyone who's ever worked with a church or had an office in a church building or answered a church phone knows that most churches receive multiple calls for people who are seeking for the church to give them food, to give money, to buy them gas so that they could travel, uh, put them in a motel because they have no place to stay, they say, or could they get their name on a list for gift baskets around Christmas time or around Thanksgiving? So the common idea about benevolence is the church is a source where people turn to receive whatever benevolence they may receive at church or congregational expense. We're going to seek to show in this study that the Bible teaches that the local church is to give benevolence only to those who are Christians. Now that doesn't mean those who are not Christians, those who are not members of the body of Christ, that doesn't mean they will not receive help. They can receive benevolent help from individual Christians, but the church out of its treasury may not. So let's look at benevolence and raise the question, who can the church help? And let's focus on what the question really is here. The question is not, should care be given to those who are needy? We all agree that those who are needy should be helped. The question is not, is the church obligated to some? The church is obligated to some. The question is not, can individuals care for non-Christians? That by care, we're talking about giving benevolent care. And the answer is yes, the individuals can do that. The question is not, will care be provided for orphan children? Care will be provided for orphan children. Nor is the question, do non-Christians deserve help? They do. That's not the question. The question we're pursuing is this, can the church out of its treasury help those who are non-Christians or can it help only those who are Christians or as the Bible calls them, saints? That's the question. So let's raise the question now, who can the church help? We're going to make a quick run through these passages. We have Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 6, Acts 11, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9, and 1 Timothy 5. These are all dealing with church benevolence meaning the church out of its treasury, functioning as a unit, not what individuals may do. We'll come to that in a moment. But all of these passages are directing and addressing church benevolence. So let's start with Acts chapter 2. 
It was believers who were to be helped. Now all who believed were together, Acts 2, 44, and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. This was among those who believed. Acts 4, it was believers, verses 32 to 35. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart. Now verse 34 says, nor was there anyone among them who lacked among those who believed, in other words. So it was believers who were helped. Acts chapter 6, it was disciples that were helped, verses 1 through 7. Verse 1 says, now in those days the number of disciples were multiplying and there arose a complaint among the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. That is, the widows of the disciples. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So here we have disciples that were being helped. Well, Acts chapter 11, it was brethren, another term for those who are Christians. That in the days, these days, the prophet prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch and one named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each one according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren. So it was disciples who were helping brethren. Romans 15, 25 to 31, talks about a collection being taken up for the poor among the saints. Look at verse 25. I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. For it pleased those of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are at Jerusalem. Again, verse 30 mentions that this would be acceptable to the saints. Well, let's go again. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, there would be a collection for the saints. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, so you also must do. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 4 simply shows again that it was saints. Speaking of that same contribution that was identified in 1 Corinthians 16, this was for the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 9, 1-15, again it was for the saints. Now concerning the ministering to the saints. Look at verse 12. For the administration of the service not only supplies the need of the saints, but also the abounding through many thanksgiving to God. Now one other passage, 1 Timothy 5:16 uses the term widow indeed. If any man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are really widows. That is, widows indeed, King James Version renders that. Verse 5 identifies a widow indeed as one who trusts in God. Now let's take these passages these nine passages and notice that it was brethren, believers, disciples, saints, a widow indeed. Also notice that Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8, and 2 Corinthians 9 are talking about the same identical case or the same identical event. So now let's raise the question, who can the church relieve? Let's think on one side we have a list of passages that mention saints or some equivalent like believers or brethren in Acts 2, Acts 4, Acts 6, Acts 11, Romans 15, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 Corinthians 8, 2 Corinthians 9, and 1 Timothy 5. Now the passage it mentions the church can take out of its treasury and help the non-saints is missing on the other side. There is no passage that authorizes that. Now thirdly, let us notice a distinction between the individual 
and the church. Now we know what the question is. The question is, can the church take out of its treasury and help just anyone, or is the church really limited in its scope of benevolence? What we have seen is nine New Testament passages that tell us the church out of its treasury can help those who are saints, those who are Christians, those who are disciples. But let us establish a distinction between the individual and the church. Now, let's talk about some misconceptions about the church and the individual. Some have the idea the individual is a church. So whatever I'm doing, a church is doing because I am a church. Some have the idea that what the individual can do, the church can do. So if I find a passage that tells me an individual can do something, that's telling me the church can do that. Others have the concept that when individuals act, the church is acting. Let's consider the fact the individual and the church are not the same. The body has many members. Notice the contrast. The body has many members. Verse 12 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians. For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being one are one body, so also is Christ. The church is made up of many members. Let's notice again verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 12. For in fact the body is not one member but many. An individual is one member, but the church as a collectivity is many. Let's notice the role of the individual and the church are not the same. 1 Timothy 5.16 makes this clearer than any other passage. There is a responsibility that the individual has the church is not to have. If any man, believing man or woman, has widows, let them relieve them. And do not let the church be burdened that it may relieve those who are widows indeed. There's a difference in the role of the individual and the church. There is a difference in individual action and individuals acting together and collective action. What do we mean? Well, look at Matthew 18. In dealing with an offense that is personal, if a brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, that at the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Now verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. In other words, what's taken place previous to that was the individual or individuals working and the church is not involved. So there is a difference in individual action, individuals acting, and furthermore, collective action. Perhaps we could picture it more like this. Look at Matthew chapter 18. If any brother... if if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. That's individual action. But if you'll not hear, take with you one or two more that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. That's individuals acting. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. That's the church as a collectivity acting. Now let's consider some areas wherein the individual and the church may differ. They differ in their work and in their responsibility. We've already noted 1 Timothy 5, 16. The individual has responsibility the church does not have. If any believing man or woman has widows, let them relieve them and do not let the church be burdened. They differ in work and in responsibility. They differ in how money is obtained. An individual may buy and sell, like James 4.13 would say. But a church receives its money from free will contribution, 1 Corinthians 16.1 and 2. They differ in name. 
the individual wears the name Christian. If any man suffer as a Christian, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16. And Acts 11, verse 26, disciples, plural, were called Christians. One of those would be a Christian. So the individual wears the name Christian, but the church as a collectivity does not wear the name Christian. It may wear the name Church of God, like the church at Corinth. Or Romans 16, 16 says, the churches of Christ, a plurality of local churches, were called churches of Christ. One of those would be a church of Christ. They differ in name. Now let's consider the difference in individual and collective action. We might illustrate this by thinking of a link, like a link from a chain. You might have a plurality. You might have links, like loose in a keg or barrel at the hardware store. But let's join them together end to end, and now we have a chain. And so it's now one unit. Well, likewise, Taking that same principle, we have an individual like the individual link. You might have individuals that are, not, that are not banding together as a unit, a local church, but those individuals acting. But when the church comes together, it's like a chain that's acting as a unit. And now we have congregational or collective action. There's a difference in individual action and collective action. Now here's our conclusion. Number one, the responsibility of the individual is not the responsibility of the church. So when I find a New Testament passage that lays upon the individual the responsibility of caring for the needy who are beyond those who are Christians, that lays no responsibility upon the church. Secondly, what the individual does is not the actions of the church. Thirdly, passages that address individual responsibility do not apply to the church. Now here's what we've seen. The question, that is, what is the question about benevolence? Who can the church help and the distinction in the individual and the church? Now let's raise the question, is my church the one in the Bible? When it comes to these very matters we've been discussing, how does this compare with the church of which you are a part? Do you have a part with a church that hands out money to all who come along? They give food and they give uh, gas money, they motel money, food baskets to everyone in the community. How does the church of which you are a part compare to the church we read about in the pages of the Bible? And that is the concept that many have. The church is just a, a spot where they go and they receive benevolence for everybody in the community that's willing to come. But what we've seen tonight, or in this study today, we've seen the question, and who can the church help? and the distinction in the individual and the church. How does that compare with what you read about in the pages of the New Testament? How does that compare with the church that you're a part? Is my church the one that you read about in the Bible? Stay with us as we continue these studies. We'll have one more, lesson nine in the series of nine, as we'll talk about another subject relative to the church you read about in the Bible.